right, good to see everybody tonight. I hope you're having a good week so far. I am. Thanks for asking. I heard a good one today. What do you call four Spanish bullfighters in quicksand? Cuatro Cinco. Isn't that good? We were just told that. Somebody came into the office. It's a good one. That was on a Laffy Taffy wrapper. You're welcome. Joshua tonight. Book of Joshua. Hope you got your hand out. They got in a little late. My fault. Apologize. Get your hand out. Joshua chapter number one tonight. We're going to read the first nine verses here. Joshua one, one through nine. It says, now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses, from the wildernesses and the... And this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so shall I be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, and thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but uh, thou shalt meditate therein day and night. That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Let's pray, and then we'll continue our series tonight, Journeys of Faith. Lord, again, we're just grateful to be here this evening. Lord, what an opportunity we have every week to get together just to fellowship. Lord, to open up your word. Lord, and I pray you continue to, to work through our hearts, through our lives, through this series as we look at... Um, character after character and their journeys of faith and how we can apply different aspects of, of their walk with you to our own walks, Lord. I pray that you strengthen our, our walk, Lord, uh, strengthen our faith, strengthen our trust in you, Lord. I pray that everything that we do brings glory and honor to you. Be with our time together now, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, uh, there was a lot of uh, indifference to missions in the 19th century back in, over in England. And one man's efforts really stood out in this time. It was a, he was a cobbler by trade and his name was William. He also pastored a very small Baptist congregation at the time. He was consumed with uh, bringing the gospel to the peoples of the world. And one day in the quietness of this little cobbler shop, he surrendered to God's call to the mission field. He believed that it was his duty and every man's duty who believed the gospel to make it known throughout the world. He said, here am I, send me. There was a lot of ridicule, a lot of rejection. There was a lot of sacrifice, a lot of suffering, but still this William persisted. He knew that God wanted to use him to reach people of all nations, even though there were no mission boards back then. Right? There, there was no real interest in even sending out missionaries, but still he persisted in fulfilling this call on his life. And through one sermon preached throughout England, he preached that was entitled, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. I love that. He was a missionary uh, because of that, uh, a series of sermons that he preached and missionary society began. He finally reached India where he felt uh, cold and where he ministered faithfully for seven years before he saw one Indian man saved. Seven years. He amid disease, death, discouragement, and both reaching his mission field and uh, along with serving there, there was one characteristic of his life that truly stood out. He kept his focus on God and God gave him the grace to continue. 
He kept his focus on God. God gave him the grace to continue. William was God's instrument to awaken England to the command to evangelize the entire world. It says near the end of his life, William called out to a missionary friend. He said, you have been speaking about Dr. Carey. He said, when I'm gone, say nothing about Dr. Carey, but speak about Dr. Carey's God. William Carey, he found himself at the crossroads. There, 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 there was a point where he had to choose between serving God as a missionary, the way that God had commanded or called his life to do, or staying a cobbler, small town preacher in England. He had to choose between the two. Think about it. We often, even ourselves, we come to, to different crossroads in our lives where we have to uh, uh, come to a point of decision where we have to take an action. We, we, we get to a point and we know it's either move this direction or move this direction. And at these points of decision, what happens is it determined whether or not we are going to do something great for God or not. First Kings chapter 18, 21 says, Elijah came unto all the people and said, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. Conviction, that's called. In Joshua 1, we're, we're looking at uh, uh, the children of Israel here and they're coming to a crossroads. Right, Joshua's assuming command. Moses has been God's chosen leader uh, for so long. And through this time of deliverance for the children of Israel uh, through Egypt and through the wilderness. Right, and right up to the boundary. I can't imagine. Right up to the boundary of the promised land. Moses led and Moses was the, the leader. But there Moses, the servant of God, right? The servant of the Lord, he died. And, and their leader was gone and they were at a point of decision now. Right? They, they, they came to this position. Would the, the children of Israel, would they decide to finally claim God's promised land? Or would they turn back to the ways of Egypt? A lot of them complained about going back to the ways of Egypt. Right, But they were at this point of decision. What are we going to do? And through these circumstances, right, some of them being pretty serious circumstances, God still had a plan for this particular moment of decision. He says, I have a plan laid out for you. This is what I want. He wanted his people to claim the promised land, to move forward in trusting and following God. God always, right, will use this particular method in his work, in his purposes. God chooses men to lead his people. That's why churches have pastors. That's why there's missionaries going across the seas and to foreign lands. God chooses men to use as instruments. That's why he chose him out 12. That's why they then decided to start churches and, and follow this design. And God, in this particular way, chose Joshua as the new leader of the children of Israel. And Joshua had been a servant of Moses, right? He had faithfully served with him, served under him. He was trained by Moses and now he would lead the same people with the same purpose, right? To carry out the same plan that God had, even when Moses was still alive. In Deuteronomy 34, 9, it says, And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. Right? These, these journeys of faith, I, I hope you're getting something from this series. I know I am, but we're looking at Joshua tonight, right? This journey to the promised land. But number one in there, you got to look at Joshua's resume, Joshua's resume. Right? Anytime you read about Joshua, I loved Joshua and I love Joseph. Right? Those are two of my favorite characters in scripture. And when you're looking at Joshua here, though, he demonstrated this, this strong faith during all of his journey. During his faith's journey, right? His following God, his being a servant. He, he followed with a very strong faith. And yet leading the children of Israel, right, to possess the land, it was a very tremendous task that Joshua was taking on. And it would uh, require a lot, 
right? If not even a greater faith to do so, right? He, he stepped into this position led by God to accomplish these great things. He needed this faith journey. He needed to go through this and looking at the circumstances, right? When we look at Joshua's life, he had to have known, right? They, they're not going to be able to conquer these challenges in and of themselves, right? But by God, are they going to be able to accomplish these things? I mean, you're standing at the edge of the promised land and Joshua had already been into the promised land and spied, right? He'd already scoped it out. He was already excited about it, but now he's standing on the brink of entering in. And you got to imagine the thoughts as a new leader, right? Going into, oh man, we're getting ready to try and do what? To take over where? To combat, combat with who, right? But he was very confident in God's promise. That's the key. He was confident in God and God's decision and that he would be with Joshua, right? Verse number five in, in Joshua one there, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. That's underlined in my Bible. I don't know if you underline in yours, but that's a good spot to do so. Hey, God is with him. He understands that. Hey, Moses, my servant is dead. Now it's time for you to get up. Listen, but I am not going to leave you. I will not forsake you. Man, what a wonderful promise. A lot of us might wonder, why was Joshua able to enter into the promised land when so many of this other generation were not able to? Right? The, the older ones. Why, why weren't they able to go in with Joshua? But understand, Joshua was used of God and was able to enter the promised land. Why? Because he was a man of great character. Right? He was a man of great character. I mean, his resume continued in Psalm 75. Right? 75, 6 and 7. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. That, that, that is the resume of God's chosen utensils. Right? He was proven. When you look at his resume, he, he was proven. Right? God had provided water, right? In the rock of Horeb, Horeb Right? Amalek came, he fought with Israel there. And during this battle, what was taking place, Joshua provided himself to be a very obedient, a very courageous, and just a trustworthy individual to Moses. Moses, whatever you command, Moses, whatever you need, whatever you are needing, and guess what happened? Moses commanded him to do so. And he, as it says in Exodus 17, 8 through 13, he discomfited Amalek and his people. He defeated them, right? He took them down. Verse number 13, Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Joshua demonstrated great faith as he fought, as he obeyed, right? As Moses commanded, he listened. As God commanded, he listened. And he did so against the Amalekites. And in doing so, he proved himself to be someone right? Who could be used of God. God tests us. He puts us up against things to prove us. There's a quote I came across, a faith that is not worth testing is not worth trusting. Right? That's why God says to prove him in scripture, right? And it is talking about giving, right? But hey, he wants to bless us. He says, go ahead, try me out. I, I want to bless you in Malachi 3.10. I, I want to do these things. He wasn't just proven letter A there. Letter B, he was a servant. He was a servant. Right? When people today use and think about the term servant, it, it often will give this impression or, or will think that it's a, a person of low position, low esteem. Right. So somebody who's just degraded. We, we think of like Joseph's situation. Right. When he was a servant in Potiphar's house. Right. Just a, 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 a slave, basically. Right. That, then that's oftentimes where we go. But when God uses the term servant. Right. Then we got to take note because he, he's not speaking of uh, this low thing. It signifies honor and it signifies greatness. 
Right? In the Bible, when, when God often would refer to somebody, his chosen leaders, he would refer to them as a servant of the Lord, a servant of God. They are servants, right? It's a, it's a very valued thing. Exodus 24, verses 12 and 13. And the Lord said unto Moses, come up to me into the mount and be there. And I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments, which I have written that thou mayest teach them. And Moses rose up and his minister Joshua and Moses and his minister Joshua and Moses went up into the mount of God. Mark 10, 45, for even the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. This idea of God saying you are a servant, we are servants of God. It's not a degrading thing. It's a good thing. We get to serve God. Joshua was a servant to Moses. And we see uh, specifically throughout uh, scriptures where uh, he demonstrated this while Moses was on Mount Sinai, right? Receiving the Ten Commandments by, while Moses was on the mountain speaking with God 40 days, 40 nights. Joseph is here, or, or Joshua rather, is here patiently waiting for him to return. He, he was being patient. He was obedient. He ministered to the people, I came across it. I, I really liked what somebody said. He said, people are prepared to lead when they have learned to serve. P people are prepared to lead when they have learned to serve. And Joshua learned to serve before God made him the leader. Right? That, 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 that's why oftentimes in churches, people are, are put into positions because of their servant's heart. At our last church, we had the Servant's Heart Award every year. Right? And two years in a row, it was a little 83-year-old lady who won it, Miss Dean, because she had a servant's heart. She would show up before church and mop our church. Right? She would show up and clean the bathrooms on Saturday because she said, I can move a broom. Right? That's a servant's heart. Joshua uh, not only learned to serve God, but he also learned to serve men. Right? He, he wasn't less of a leader uh, because he served other people. Right? And we, we got to get our minds around this. Serving God and others was the, the, the overshadowing purpose of all that Joshua did, all of his actions. He was serving the people, serving God. Serving God, serving the people. That's who he was. It was quoted once, the measure of a man's greatness is not how many people serve him, but how many he serves. Right? Man, what a powerful thing. Mark 10, 43 and 44. But so shall it not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. Right? Galatians 5, 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Man, when, when Joshua was chosen, right? He's chosen to be the leader of Israel. He's chosen to be this position. He was first the servant of Moses. And at the end of his life, what happens? Joshua was still known as a servant of the Lord. What a wonderful testimony, according to that term servant in scripture. At the end of his life, he was still known as the servant of the Lord. And we have to learn from this example and seek to be true and faithful servants of God. In Judges 2, 8, it says, And Joshua, the son of Nun, right? The servant of the Lord, servant of the Lord. He died and being 110 years old. Man, what, what a powerful thing. He, he was what? Proven. He was uh, uh, patient. He was, let's let her see. He was patient. Right? He was a servant. He was proven. See, he was patient. Exodus 24, 18. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mountain. Moses was in the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. I can't imagine. Right? <laughs> Moses, when are you coming back? It's been two days. You said you were going up. You're going to come back, right? Oh, it's been a week. It's been two weeks. It's been a month. It's been a month and 10, I mean, 40 days and 40 nights where the leader went up and Joshua, what happens? He was a patient man, very patient. Exodus 32, 15 and 17, Moses turned and went down from the mount and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. 
The tables were written on both their sides and on one side and on the other were they written and the tables were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. Man, it's been so long. Joseph or Joshua, I keep mixing them up. He spent 40 days waiting for Moses on Mount Sinai to come back. I mean, he, he, he could have at any point gotten impatient, gotten frustrated, gotten bored, but he chose to faithfully be patient and trust the leader and anticipate Moses' needs. This is the appointed leader that God has established. I'm going to be patient and wait. Joshua's journey of faith is this, it's such a, a um, just an example of patience. I mean, it really is. When, when you think about how he waited for Moses so many times, right? Joshua, we got to do this. Joshua, we got to do that. And he was this example of patience. Many Christians don't think twice before they resign from their class. They resign from their bus route. They leave a church, right? Because why? Because they don't want to wait. They, they don't want to be patient on God and see what God has in store for things. God desires that we remain patient on our journeys, right? That's why it's a fruit of the spirit. Right? Long suffering, waiting on God, trusting him to, uh, to accomplish his work in and through his people, through us. Right? The patience of Joshua paid off because he received this blessing of entering into the promised land. And we will be glad when we receive blessings when we enter into our promised land. Right? That, that's the promised end goal. Psalm 24 or 27, 14. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Man, what an example to us. During World War II, Hitler began to blitz London and the British government evacuated people by the train loads. And as the citizens of England were running towards the trains, there was a man who saw a young boy running to safety by himself. The man looked at the boy and said, you know where you're going? The boy replied, no. But the king does. I don't know where I'm going, but the king does. We, we don't know where God is taking us on our journeys of faith all the time. There, there are things that we come in to uh, uh, deal with, things that we face, decisions that we have to make. And we don't know where God is trying to lead. And we may not understand periods of waiting, periods of silence. But we can trust the heart and the plan of our king. We can do so by waiting patiently on the Lord. I mean, that's just biblical, right? We have to trust what he's doing. Understand this, Joshua, he had a vision, D, letter D there. He had a vision. In Numbers 14, 6 through 10, it speaks of... Uh, um, him speaking to the company of the children of Israel. You know, he's talking to, you know, the land which was passed uh, through to search it and exceedingly good land. And the Lord delight in us and he will bring us into this land. And he had this vision of God. And, and Joshua had this godly vision that he then, when he and Caleb searched the land, right? When he spied on the land and they came back and they were super excited and they were energized because of all the potential and all the blessings that they saw there the land was exceedingly good they said and it flowed with milk and honey man what an amazing place joshua's vision to claim this land was based upon god's word right even back then and, and what's so amazing about joshua is he never lost that vision he knew what god had in store for them and he was strong in it joshua 1 6 be strong and of a good courage for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. I swear unto their fathers to give them. He trusted, he had faith and patience. Joshua knew that the children of Israel would possess the promised land. I know that we're going to go in there. right? I know we're going to accomplish these things because God had already promised it. And he acted on his belief. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law happy is he. Where there is no vision, that's speaking to the word of God. 
where God is not present, the people perish. We can see that happening in our nation. Right? But what happens? God has a vision if we repent, if we turn to him, if we trust in him, we know God will turn everything around. Takes us. Number two in your notes there, Joshua's responsibility. We saw his resume. But Joshua had a responsibility. You can jump right to letter A, to provide leadership, to provide leadership. Man, on our journeys of faith, God is going to appoint us to positions of leadership. You say, well, no, I'm no leader. That, that, that this is what we're talking about. You might not even recognize it when God promotes you to these positions, right? Leadership is this. Leadership is influence. Okay, understand that leadership is influence. And because of that, we all lead because at some point we all influence other people. You are an influence to other church members. You are an influence to the younger generation. You are an influence to your family. You are an influence in whatever ministry you are actively participating in, in a classroom, in your home, in a bus route, whatever it is, in a business, in a church. We are all placed into certain types of leadership positions because we all have certain types of influence. And God places us there. It's our responsibility. And no matter what capacity God puts us into these uh, 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 positions to fill, each one of us is called to be a leader in these positions. Right? It's our job. It's our role. We're supposed to do it. Right? Joshua provided great leadership for his family. Right? Joshua 24, 15. If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Man, what an example. He understood, right? This is a position of leadership that I have been granted. As parents, we are in positions of leadership. As family members, we are in position of leadership. As church members, we are each in a certain position of leadership because of our position of influence, right? It's time for uh, uh, dads to take leadership, Right To understand the influence that they have in their homes, we have to determine to lead our families as men. Right? There was a, a Time Magazine article that came out and it said, rising divorce rates and out of wedlock births mean that more than 40% of all children, this is going back, born between 1970 and 1984, are likely to spend much of their childhood living in single parent homes. That's in that the 70 to 84 time period. I can only imagine nowadays, right? The impact of these fatherless homes on the children, they say is very significant, if not devastating. The article went on to say, studies of young criminals have found that more than 70% of all juveniles in state reform institutions come from fatherless homes. Children from broken families are nearly twice as likely as those in two-parent families to drop out of high school. That's going back to a study done in 2007. And I, it amazes me that even back then, Right? They were twice as likely to drop out of high school from split homes as to multi-parent homes. Man, what a, what a uh, difference 10, 15 years makes on society. I mean, Joshua was a great leader because he first followed God's leading and fathers have to follow God's leading. Right? It's so important for us to get that. Right? We have to live our lives. We have to lead in our homes in order to be effective leaders for our families by following God. Joshua led his family, but he also led God's people. Joshua 1.10 says, Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people. Then he, commanded, then he led them. Then he was letting them know, saying, right? And it goes on throughout the story, right? As he assumes the position of command there. It was quoted that what is the difference between an obstacle and an opportunity? Our attitude towards it. 
right? Our attitude towards it. Every opportunity has a difficulty and every difficulty has an opportunity. Simple quote, but powerful quote. And every difficulty that we face, there's an opportunity there. Man, my car breaks down. What a tremendous difficulty. But at the same time, guess what? The mechanic mechanic got a track, amen? Because it's still an opportunity for me. Right, man, there's always something. Why? Because be here, we could claim the promises. To claim the promises. It's... Joshua, he had the responsibility, right? You put your name in there. Daniel's responsibility to provide leadership. Daniel's responsibility to claim the promises. Fill in your name. Trevor's responsibility. Gavin's responsibility. Micah's responsibility. Okay, as they grow and they mature. Hey, we all have this in our lives, right? To claim the promises Joshua 1, 4, and 5. From the wilderness to this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall, uh, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. What is it saying? Joshua had this great responsibility to claim the land that God had promised to the people. You ever think about that land that he went to claim? The promised land was 300,000 square miles. That's a lot of land. I mean, that's what was promised to them. But because of a lack of faith at the children of Israel, they actually never claimed more than 10% of the land God had promised them. Crazy, right? 300,000 square miles, but they just barely claimed 10% of it. We're like, yeah, they went into the promised land. Kind of. They went on the edge of it. They went in a little bit of it, right? They never went in there and got everything God had given them. And unfortunately, this is the response of a lot of us as Christians, Right? God promises us such great things, blessings, and perhaps there, there might be some uh, promises that God uh, has given you or promises that he has given churches or promises he has given ministries, but it's our responsibility. We have to take and claim it for ourselves. Right? What does that mean? Hey, we, we go out and we tell people about the Lord. God tells us, right? Hey, we're planting seeds. He, he's going to give an increase. Hey, he's going to bless us. He's going to honor our faithfulness to him. But we got to claim it for ourselves. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. There's a lot of times God wants to bless us, but doesn't because our lack of faith. That's why churches are closing their doors. Right? That's why people are leaving churches. That, that, that's why relationships are falling apart because there's places there, church God wants to bless, families God wants to bless, our relationship, but because we lack the faith, we don't get the blessings that God promised us. God understands this. We have to have enough confidence in God to claim the promises that it gives us. Do do we have the confidence in God? That's what it comes down to. Do you trust God in these situations? What what is holding us back, right, from going forward on our journeys of faith, on our trusting in the Lord? Man, I did a sermon for the teens a few months ago about that. What is holding you back from following God? That's a question you got to constantly ask yourself, I think, because we all have things that I, I strongly believe this. Every Christian has things that they know they should be doing for God, but they're not for some reason. Even pastors, even missionaries, even Sunday school teachers, right? There's always something I think that God has told us, man, you need to do this, but we don't because something holds us back. Right? God wants to give us strength. God wants to give us comfort. God wants to give us peace. And yet we see that person and God says, give them a track, tell them about me. And we say, no, I can't do it. Is it pride? I don't know. God hates it. 
Right? Well, well, I don't know what it is, but what's holding us back from going forward for God? And until we act on God's promises, we cannot experience the victory God wants to give us. That's how it works. Joshua also claimed God's promise that he would conquer his enemies. Joshua went out and claimed those things. Joshua 1.5a, right? There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life, he says. God promised Joshua this. Hey, complete victory in conquering of the enemies. What a powerful promise that is. Everything that you face, everything that you go up against, you are going to defeat it. You are going to have victory. Joshua. Right? Man, that's a wonderful thing. And in the same way, though, he promises us complete victory over sin. And yet we constantly fall to it. Right? Me, me and Megan, uh, um, it was a while back. I'm sure I mentioned it. But, you know, one of her college buddies posted, what is the worst of the seven deadly sins? Right? And there was a big discussion on uh, the, that friend's Facebook page. Like, what's the worst one? Is it gluttony? Well, yeah, it's gluttony. Or is it this? Is it that? Is it? And it's like, no, it's pride. Everything comes back to pride. Right? Where, what's holding us back? Where, where, where have we been promised to go? What have we been promised to have victory over? And he promises that we can what, be more than conquerors through him. We are able to get through this. Right? God promises that. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God which giveth us what the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 36 and 37, as it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We are more than this. Letter three here, Joshua's resources, his resources. You ever start the day with the thought, how am I going to get all this stuff done? Yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> how in the world are we going to get everything done that we are supposed to get done? I can imagine Joshua waking up, some millions of people now following him, going into the promise. How in the world am I going to get everything done? Maybe that's how Joshua felt, I don't know. But he assumed this leadership. He began to claim God's promises. There was a lot of work that he had to do in order to enjoy the victory of the promised land. And as God always does, what happened? He provided the resources that Joshua needed in order to accomplish the work that he was supposed to do. God wants to provide for us. These resources that God provided to Joshua are still available to us as his children today. Resources are a good thing to have, right? I still think the greatest resource in the church is sitting right here in the pews. God's people are the greatest resource that the church had. They're just as powerful and they, they are just as helpful, these resources that God promises. And what are those things? Letter A here, God's presence. <coughs> God's presence. God is on our side. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Zechariah 4, 6 says, then he answered and spake unto me saying, this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel saying, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. It's only by God. Stories told of some preachers who, uh, uh, many years ago were discussing D.L. Moody and the possibility of inviting him to speak at one of their meetings. One of the preachers who opposed asking D.L. Moody somewhat critically asked, does D.L. Moody have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit? To which an older and wiser preacher replied, no, the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on D.L. Moody. Right? God, God told Moses, now therefore go and I will be with thy mouth in Exodus. 
I always found that interesting because we can look uh, in the New Testament where it says Moses was well learned in the Egyptian tongue and all that. Right? God told Joshua, though, I will be with thee. God told Jeremiah, and they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. <coughs> and God says to us, what? Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Those are promises of God's presence. Let her be here, God's preserved word. These are our resources. God's preserved word. This is the same book of the law uh, had been kept for us today, right? God has preserved this wonderful resource of his word for us. All of our matters of faith and practice stem from this. Right? Matthew 5, 18, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, right? One jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. God commanded Joshua to meditate on this resource, this holy book, right? The Bible. And so the question comes, how much time do you spend meditating and thinking on God's word? How, how often are you in this book? Is it closed, collecting dust on the shelf all week? Or is it open on the table? Right? Are, are you in it? Are you reading it? Are you looking through it? Man, what a resource, right? God, God commanded Joshua, you got to be in this book. This, right? Verse number eight, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then, right, thou shalt make thy way prosperous and thou shalt have good success. One of the only times success is ever mentioned in scripture and it stems from our reliance on his word. It was quoted, if we want the God of truth, we must know the truth of God. If we want the God of truth to work in our lives, we have to what? Know the truth of God. What does that mean? We got to read the Bible. Right? We challenge our kids. They, they, they do it every summer now for junior camp. Hey, we're having a, a memory verse challenge. When was the last time you memorized a verse of the Bible as an adult? I mean, it's an interesting thought. Aren't we supposed to? If we want the God of truth, we got to know the truth of God. God also commanded Joshua to obey his word. He told him to observe, to do all that is in there, right? Simply observe it. Listen, we mark our Bibles, right? It, it's, it's an interesting thought. We often will mark our Bibles, but we don't let our Bibles mark us. We're not marked by this. People don't, people don't associate Christians with the word of God very often. They associate it with good behavior. Nowadays, they associate it with skinny pants and flannel shirts in this movement. Right now, we, we got to understand, Paul right, exhorted us to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. It's supposed to be in there, right? Maybe we're not using the resources that God's allowed for us to have in our lives, right? We, we have to make that decision. Joshua was faithful to lead the, the people into the promised land, right? So I'm wondering in what areas God is leading you to provide leadership and to make a difference in those people around you. It's an interesting thought. As we look at lives like Joshua's and we think of the faith that it took to uh, assume this position, God placed him into this position of leading countless people, right? And to go into this promised land and he had to have that faith to do so. Man, what a challenging thing, right? But like I said, we all are put into positions of leadership, whether it be your Sunday school, whether it be a ministry involvement, maybe it's just a family, maybe whatever it is, but we are placed there. How are we following God in those positions? Are we allowing God? Are we using the resources that he gives us? Where are we at tonight? 
Where, where's your faith journey? Have you given up on God's leadership? No, no longer trusting in him. Patience is out the door. I'm just going to do what I feel like in the moment. That's a very modern day Christendom philosophy. Also, it's all feeling based. This makes me feel right. So God's got to want me to do this. Be very cautious with that type of thinking, right? I'm sure it was good to, to worship the serpent for a while until God swallowed him up in the earth. All right, let's pray, and then we'll take some prayer requests tonight. Lord, I just pray you continue to work through this series as we look at these characters in Scripture. Lord, help us to still rely on your word. Help us to still uh, glean from it, Lord. Just uh, really apply it to our own lives, what principles we can learn and just uh, utilize in our daily lives to truly live a life that brings glory and honor to you, Lord. I pray that our church is identified as just that, a church that follows God, that trust in your word, Lord, utilizes the resources that you've allowed for us to have your presence, your word, Lord, what a powerful resource that is. Lord, thank you so much for our church. Be with our prayers in Jesus name. Amen.